Well, now that it's 11:30, uh, we're going to get started on the, uh, the next presentation. This is uh, Kurt, who is Mr. Oni, who has uh, been with the OCP since uh, oh, 2013, and uh, he's the maintainer of Oni, and he's going to be talking about some of the advances that uh, are being proposed for Oni. He also has the distinction of uh, standing between you and lunch. So take it away, Kurt. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Scott. All right. Uh, my name's Kurt Bruni. I'm a principal engineer at Cumulus Networks. Um, as Scott said, I am sort of the co-creator of ONI, a custodian of ONI. And today I'm going to talk to you about ONI in a more secure environment. I use the term secure boot, but as we all know, security, it's a vast topic. It's deep. It's wide. In 25 minutes, we will not cover everything. Um, but we will like to touch upon how we can have more secure environments. So to get started, um, just a show of hands, who's heard of ONI? All right, that's good. How many people have heard of UEFI? OK, good. How about uh, uh, a TPM? All right. Who here has generated a public and private key pair before? All right, excellent. Good. All right, if we can uh, move forward probably two slides. Um, so here's a, a bit of an overview. We're going to talk about trust. What does it mean to trust things? Um, I'm going to spend some time reviewing some cryptographic topics because in order to even have a discussion, we have to have some terminology in common in order to communicate because it is kind of a technical. Uh, we'll review some security technologies that are in play today. And then at the, towards the end, we'll get into how can we apply these things to ONI and to our OCP hardware. Okay. So security is really, it's about trust. What do you trust? Whom do you trust? I mean, do you trust your hardware? Do you trust the CPU manufacturer? Do you trust the FPGAs, the FPGA code, uh, the firmware code? And then on top of that, do you trust the software? Do you trust bootloaders? Do you trust the network OS installer? Is it installing the right thing? Do you trust the operating system once it's running? All these things involve trust, and so that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in security and cryptography, there are a lot of concepts and terminology. It's a bit of an alphabet soup. There's also tons of specifications, very detailed, um, full of acronyms. And there's a lot of jargon, and so we're going to try and move through that, cover a little bit of that so that we can discuss how this can apply to ONI. Next slide. Um, so here's uh, some cryptographic building blocks, some fundamental primitives that uh, some of you are probably already familiar with. First one is the secure hash, or a digest. And that's where you take a message, you pass it through a cryptographic function like you know, SHA-1, SHA-256, MD5, and it spits out a fingerprint, right? And the nice property of this, these functions are if the message changes at all, the digest, which is smaller, um, also changes, is, is unique with high probability. So there's the secure hash. Um, the next primitive that we'll be talking about is the hash extend operation. Um, if you guys could come in, come on in, quick. There's plenty of seats. All right, that looks pretty good. So the hash extend operation, this is where you have an initial hash value. You concatenate on some of your message, and then you hash that to get a new value, and then you use that as the seed value for the next time you use the extend operation. And so the idea is you keep appending a new message, you get a new hash value, then you append a new message, you get a new hash value, you get a fingerprint of the sequence of messages. So if any of those messages in a chain were to change, you'd have a different answer at the end, which you could compare and say, oh, something changed here. Um, and then we also have public and private key crypto. I'm hoping everyone's familiar with those terms. Um, but you 
you just distribute your public key. You, people use that to encrypt things to send to you. And then as a single owner of your private key, you can decrypt those messages. OK, next slide, please. Um, and this leads us to digital signatures. Um, so you want to verify the originator of a digital object. And you want to certify that it's coming from someone and verifying that it, A, it's from that person, and B, that it also hasn't been tampered with. And so what we do is we create these things called a digital signature. Now, for the experts in the room, apologies, because this is a high-level quick take. But uh, it's enough to uh, have a common footing for us to discuss concepts. So what happens is someone wants to send a message and sign it. So that, that initial message is hashed. So you get the little fingerprint. Uh, that fingerprint is then encrypted. And we call that the signature. So then the sender sends that little signature along with the unencrypted message to the recipient. On the receiving end, the recipient uses the same hash algorithm and hashes the message and gets the fingerprint. And then using their public key, they decrypt the signature that came along with it. And then they compare them and say, are these the same? They should be the same. And if they're not the same, then either it wasn't the person who signed it or the message has been tampered with. All right, next slide, please. And so all of these things help to build a root of trust and to maintain a chain of trust. Um, so fundamentally, in any security system, some core component of the system is trusted. Um, you know, and the trusted core is then used to verify the next stage of software. It validates a signature on that piece of software, loads it, executes it, and then this, the next stage performs a similar operation and helps to perpetuate this chain of trust over and over. And, and that's basically how the, all of these things work, is building up upon these chains of trusts. Um, OK, next slide. Um, and so here is that, uh, all those words as a picture. So there's a root component. Maybe it has a public key in it. And before moving to the next component, it first validates the signature on it. And then it loads that next component. And then each component does that going forward, maintaining those chains of trust. Next slide, please. So here are a few uh, CPU security technologies. There, and there's lots of them. Um, and different CPU manufacturers have come up with different uh, schemes and methods. And they have different brand names. And it can be a bit confusing. But on x86-64, there's things like Intel Boot Guard and UEFI and TXT, Trusted Execution Technology. Uh, ARM has Trust Zone. It also has UEFI. In U-boot-based systems, there's something called Verified Boot, um, NXP and Freescale PowerPC chips. There's also UEFI when they're ARM and Verified Boot sometimes when they're PowerPC and U-boot-based. Um, and in all these things, there are thousands of pages of specifications. Uh, Who's ever read the UEFI spec? Three people. Awesome. I have two friends. Um, how about something from the TCG, the, the folks who make the, the TPM specification? I see half a hand went up. Yeah. These are uh, thrilling and exhilarating documents to read. I encourage you all to give them a browse. But fundamentally, in my experience, it's all about verifying digital signatures on, on digital objects, be it code or firmware. Uh, next slide, please. So another key security technology is what's called the Trusted Platform Module, uh, TPM for short. This is a rather small device, but it's also rather complex. And as I was alluding to, there's thousands of pages of specifications about what these things are supposed to do. And they are quite capable um, today in this limited forum. I'm going to focus in on an aspect called measured boot, which uses the uh, platform configurations from the TPM. Um, these are a hardware implementation of that hash extend operation we talked about earlier. It's a way, I, f I forget how many bits wide these things are, but uh, we'll see how uh, 
ex measuring and extending into the TPM registers, we can measure the boot process, which is a, a part of verifying how things are booted. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to get a little bit more specific uh, and, and talk about how most Linux systems boot on x86-64. So I won't be covering how ARM boots on a UEFI or how U-boot does a secure boot. There is some wonderful, for folks who are interested on those things, there are, is some wonderful good descriptions from the Chrome OS project for how Chromebooks boot, which is quite fascinating. Um, but here we're gonna talk about uh, just this platform. So in UEFI, there is a database of public keys. Um, the KEK, which is the key exchange key, and also the DB. These are just, again, part of the alphabet soup. The KEK and the DB is where the public keys are. And again, experts, apologies, this is the high level view. Um, there's also revoked keys, which is called DBX, because not only do you want to validate, like what happens when someone's key is compromised, right? Um, so they publish revocation lists, and if you see an, a binary object that's signed by a revoked key, you shouldn't trust it. So you have to maintain a revocation database as well. Uh, another way, another component in a, on a Linux-based system is the, the shim. It's an EFI program. It was developed by uh, Fedora and Sousa. And it is a small EFI application that has been signed by someone who's trustworthy. And that public key resides in the UEFI. And it, has, it maintains this chain of trust. We'll see in a subsequent slide visually how this works. But it's a very thin EFI application that allows us to perpetuate the chain of trust and also put control of the platform keys in the owner, into the hands of the owner of the platform. Another component of the SHIM project is this thing called the Machine Owner, owner Key Database, the MOC, and the MOC Manager. It's, it's an additional database of keys similar to the, the KEK and the DB and UEFI where the owner of a platform can register and install additional keys that will be used in the verification process of the next stages of the boot. All right, next slide, please. So here's a picture of how UEFI, the firmware, would first validate SHIM. So inside of UEFI, there's a database of public keys. This SHIM EFI on the right-hand side, this signature, uh, it has been signed with the private key of an entity whose public key resides in the database. Now, for all practical purposes for the hardware that we actually use in practice, the signing authority here is Microsoft. So what happens is that the owner, the creator of the shim binary, ships it off to Microsoft to be validated. And there's some, some process takes on the order of weeks. And Microsoft looks through this little shim thing and says, yeah, it looks OK. I don't think it's, it's harmful. And they'll sign it because Microsoft's public key is in the database of essentially every BIOS vendor's firmware. So this little shim has been signed by Microsoft. All right, next. But the key thing to note is that inside of shim, there is also a public key which is owned by the, the creator of the shim. So, and it's the, uh, would be the creator of Oni when we get to talking about that. And so the shim boots up okay. UEFI says, hey, this thing's signed, it looks great, let's start it up. And so shim comes up. And then it looks for the next thing in the chain to, to load. And what happens in a Linux-based system is that there's a EFI version of Grub. Everyone's familiar with Grub. And that has also been signed. But now the signature could be something different because now Shim is the one doing the verification. And so it uses a couple different sources for those public keys. It looks at that internal public key. It looks at the UEFI database. And it also consults the machine owner key database, the MockDB. So there's a couple different ways to uh, provide that signature. 
Another thing that you, we've, how many people have written an EFI program? Who's ever, oh, one person, heard of the EDK, all right, and Tiano Core? It's actually not that bad. I mean, it's, you can compile it and install it on a VM and play around with it. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, but what's interesting here, and it, for anyone who's ever programmed in UEFI, it's all about interfaces and introspection. And so there's these, all the software is built on interfaces. And so Shim registers an interface with the UEFI system. And essentially, it registers an API call that other programs can utilize. And the interface it registers is an interface to these three databases of keys. And that'll be important in a second. So next slide, please. So now the next phase is Grub. So Grub has been verified and it starts to run. But again, it's still an EFI program. We haven't vectored into Linux yet. We're still in the UEFI pre-boot stage. And uh, so now Grub can load a kernel and validate its signature. And again, its signature can be from one of these uh, UEFI databases or the mock or uh, the shim that comes inside of the, uh, or the, the shims key. And the way Grub does that is it invokes this interface that shim provided and utilizes those interfaces to validate the next, the next level. All right, next slide, please. So when we string all that together, this is the same picture as before, but now it's less generic. We see UEFI validating shim, which validates Grub, which validates Linux. And then Linux can perpetuate this. You know, Linux can validate kernel modules that it loads into its address space. It can validate user space programs and other binary objects. But again, it's all built upon the verification of digital signatures. Next slide, please. So now the question is, how can we apply these technologies to ONI? Um, I should pause here for a moment and say security in ONI has been a, a bit of a question since the beginning. And it comes up every two to three months on the ONI mailing list, like, yeah, security's good. You probably want some. Um, think about how to get you there. Um, so part of what we want to do here is realize that ONI really is just, and again, this is focused on x86, it's just a Linux kernel and an initramfs operating system. It's a little operating system. So we can apply that, that uh, previous generic Linux boot chain of trust for UEFI systems to ONI as well. And so the thinking is that we'll have ONI follow that secure boot model of the, the shim and grub and the kernel. And I realized I, I skipped a small piece, and that was in the shim context and also in the grub context, not only are they validating signatures, they are also measuring the binaries that they're loading. That is, they are doing that hash extend operation. So imagine when grub is loading, if you, could you back up a, a slide or two? Right there, that's gonna be, that's pretty good. So when shim is running and it's validating grub, it can measure the green box. It hashes the green box and gets a, gets a hash key. And it'll hash extend that into a TPM register. And it'll also do that with the Linux kernel. And grub will do that with the Linux kernel. And so at the end of the chain, you can do attestation and look and see, wow, that, did that PCR and the T TPM change from my previous boot? If it did, that tells me that one of these green blobs changed, which is something you'd want to know about in, when maintaining a secure system. OK, we can move forward there. And yes. So one of the, the big aspect, aspects of ONI that I hear time and again that people really think it was like one of the coolest things is how an image is discovered and how via this waterfall method, ONI finds an image. Because there's a lot of different ways that it can find an image. It makes it pretty simple as opposed to some more traditional methods that were you know, harder to use. 
But fundamentally, you know, ONI will discover an image either as a local file using some DHCP options from a web server, and then it would download it and run that NOS installer. So the new wrinkle that we're going to introduce is after that installer is downloaded, ONI is now going to verify the signature on the installer. And so that installer is going to, is going to need to be signed by one of these keys that lives in, in one of these databases. And if the uh, verification fails, well, don't, don't run that installer. Because the installer is not the OS itself, but you know, it's still it's a piece of software that you're going to have to trust. And if you don't trust it, it could you know, do something you don't want it to do. But let's say the signature is valid. We execute the installer. So now that NOS installer runs. And it does what all OS installers do, copies some bits to the hard drive and sets up some EFI variables and says all is good and reboots. So now there's still, it's still up to that NOS to be secure boot aware. So ONI is really just to get the OS installed. ONI is not executed every single boot of the machine. Um, OS vendors will still have to implement their own secure boot, uh, boot chain. It very likely would look like the shim because everyone's, almost everyone's Linux based. Um, if we can move forward. Okay, five minutes. All right, tracking well. Um, so this is the, the next to last slide. And so all of everything that I've talked about in this talk today, it, it is uh, forward looking. You know, we're not, I'm not reporting on what we've done. These are things for 2017, working on uh, securing ONI and that boot flow and the installer and all these things. And so this is where I need your help. We all need to help each other and collaborate on some of these big questions and issues. Um, these are some couple of questions and details that came up to mind uh, quickly was, you know, what about secure firmware updates? So ONI and firmware updates is a topic that we've sort of tackled last year and the last year and a half, but we haven't talked about making sure that those firmware updates are secure. I mean, that's definitely something we want to have sort of locked down and have a good story around. Uh, what does this mean for the build system? You know, we build, ONI is compiled and build. Um, now, part, now we're going to introduce some uh, signing technology into that build chain. You know, kernels are going to need to be signed. We're going to need to compile shim. We're going to need to compile grub. There, you know, there's going to be some changes there. Um, PKI, PKI, public key infrastructure, um, managing keys, certificate authorities. You know, once you start making public and private keys, key pairs, you have to be pretty careful with your private key and how it's used. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, there are issues there. And you know, what is this going to mean for hardware vendors, folks who are compiling and distributing ONI in a signed way? Um, I don't have the answers. Um, but that is a, a definitely a topic for discussion. So thank you, everyone, for listening. That's um, my update on ONI and Secure Boot. It sounds like we have a few more minutes, which is great, because I know there will be a lot of questions. So. Questions, anyone? Right here. Uh, some vendor already shipped the, their platform with Lexi boot only. So do you see the migration pass, you know, to? Oh, the question to, is about legacy boot? Yeah. Yeah, what about the legacy systems? So if they already have legacy, how can they get the EFI on? Right. Yeah, you know, I think it's going to be a departure. I think the legacy can remain the legacy. I mean, it's, well, that's not true. It, it really depends on the hardware vendor. Because actually, a lot of our hardware partners, the firmware that's on the box is UEFI. But we're running it in CSM, which is a, com a legacy BIOS compatibility mode, is how ONI is installed. And so that part may be simpler. We just have to. Uh, compile a new version of ONI. The hardware's sort of ready. Yeah, from the manufacturer, there's no problem. Right. 
Well, even if it's in the field, well, yeah, that gets tricky because then you have to move, you, yeah, you, people have to go into the BIOS and fiddle with some menus to turn compatibility mode off and secure, secure boot mode on and, and install a new version of ONI and that gets kind of gross. So that, I think that would be tough. There's a question. Hey, thank you. So can you describe more about the UEFI database? I mean, the, if someone hacked the, the image and put the Marvel uh, public key there, so how to uh, leverage the TPM to make sure the database, the key database is secure? Ah, well, I, that is a fundamental problem. Um, so how, what if the, the UEFI database were compromised? You, And that's tough. Um, I, I don't really have a great answer for that one. Um, it's a, with a lot of these security things, uh, there's physical security, like how did it get compromised in the first place? Was it through a firmware update? Was it through a physical access? Um, Maybe I'm not following your question exactly. No, I, I mean, the, if there's some hacker to um, tempt the, the public key in the image to simulate the, the trustable. So they'd have to compromise the database in UEFI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there are going to be there bad There should be some way to protect the database as a secure. No one can tempt that, right? Right. Have, have you read the UEFI spec? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there, I just there are, wonder, there is there are, any update? There are mechanisms around that. You know, all of it typically boils down that someone had physical access. And even within UEFI, there are mechanisms for requiring passwords. Yeah, currently yeah, we are using the uh, secure variable to protect the database. Yeah. I just wonder um, the how, how to uh, leverage the TPM to is there a way to use a TPM to make sure the database is more secure, never tempted by the hacker? Well, T TPMs are good for measurement. You can sort of learn after the fact. Mm. Is right? there a way to store the, the public key in the TPM? In, yeah, I, I know the TPM I mean, is can these, yeah. these are good questions. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just yeah. Uh, yeah. brainstorming. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's great. Maybe. Sorry, I have a last question. Might be. So uh, I think a secure booth Depends is... Depends how hungry you are, <laughs> if you want to go to lunch or not. <laughs> I think a secure booth is, uh, is everybody accept that one, but uh, you mentioned about in the only the installer, so if that's also be part of the, the trust chain, but from my understand, it may not be necessary, but if it's only may not be trustable, still OS is the one fundamentally we should be trust, right? So I don't know uh, something. I think you're, here. you're touch. Let me say if I make sure I heard that correctly. There's the NOS installer and there's the NOS. It's, it's the NOS that you really want to trust. The installer could sort of be untrustworthy a little bit. I kind of agree with you because all it is is doing is installing the NOS and then it's out of the way, and then when the system reboots again, Secure Boot's gonna verify that the NOS is okay, yeah. and that's what you're gonna do day after day after day yes. after day. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, but that NOS installer is operating at elevated privileges while it's installing the NOS, so it could install something else, or try to inject a firmware update, or so that's why I included the, the NOS installer in the, in the chain of trust as well. I think it has to be. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks. Uh, just as a reminder, we're gonna all be back in here after lunch. Uh, there won't be a session in the, the room next door, so all, everybody come back here. <laughs>